Hi everyone. Um, today, sorry I'm not here, but I wanted to cover the concept of logical fallacies here with you just for a few minutes. Um, you know, these are something that tie into our unit on persuasion and um, are things that we should generally probably try to avoid when we're being persuasive in our uh, research persuasive speech. So the first thing we need to talk about is what are logical fallacies? So the definition is an error in reasoning that undermines the logic of your argument. If you haven't already gotten something to write this down on, you're going to want to take notes. So an error in reasoning that undermines the logic of your argument. So really, it's the opposite of logos. Logos is that logical appeal. It's that everything makes sense. Everything fits together. Uh, we have maybe facts and statistics and stuff to back this up. But a logical fallacy is all of that logic that you put together just breaks down. And there's some type of error or flaw in your reasoning. Um, and we're used in many different areas. Advertisements, obviously persuasive speeches and opportunities, debates. We see a lot of them in political debates, the 2016 election cycle and now the 2018 election cycle. We see a lot of this in politics right now um, in Illinois with our governor race and some of the other uh, statewide races as well. In everyday life um, and TV shows. And you know, so everyday life, uh, you know, maybe your parents have said when you've asked them to do something, they'll say, no, why? You ask as a follow-up, and they say, well, because I told you so. Well, as you'll see, that's actually a logical fallacy. Um, so we're going to talk about 10 of them. We could talk about about 200 of them, but that seems a little bit like overkill. So we're going to focus on 10 today. So the first is the slippery slope. So if you see here, you know, we have the meme. I kind of have a meme or some type of image on each slide here. Shoots paper in a trash can, declares for the NBA draft right after. You know. We often will make jokes that, you know, okay, well, I can shoot a piece of paper into a trash can. That means I must be a good basketball player, and that just isn't right. So slippery slope is a fallacy in which it is suggested that the first reasonable event leads to more unreasonable events until, until a significant end is reached. Um, so kind of the, the simple version of it I have here, if A, then B, then C, then eventually Z. So, for example, if I wake up late, I'm going to have a bad day. If I have a bad day, I'm not going to enjoy my lunch. If I don't enjoy my lunch, I'm going to go hungry. If I go hungry, I'm not going to be able to do work. If I can't do work, I'm going to lose my job. If I lose my job, I will end up without a home. This very, you know, oh, I woke up late is the, is the A, and then all these other events happen until this big event happens at the end. So that's slippery slope. The second one is post hoc ergo propter hoc. It's also known as mistaken causality. Um, we'll talk about the meme here in a second. So it really suggests that because an event occurred before another event, the first event must have caused the second. So post hoc ergo propter hoc is actually Latin, and it stands for after this, therefore because of this. After, therefore, because of. So looking at the meme here, um, she was Hannah Montana when Bush was president. Thanks, Obama. Because Miley Cyrus became what went from being Hannah Montana to Miley Cyrus after President Obama took office, clearly President Obama is to blame for Hannah Montana becoming Miley Cyrus. And that's just not true. That happened as her evolution uh, as a musician. So because B happened, A must have caused B. Um, you know, this can be said for a number of things. If uh, one, another a good example of this is. Um, murder rates increase at the same time that ice cream sales increase. Therefore, murder is caused by an increase in ice cream sales. It's just not true. There might be some relationship between the two, probably warmer weather, that might you know make people a little more on edge and, and as a result lead to more murders occurring, but ice cream sales are not causing murders. And that's, that's a post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. Red herring, as we see this nice little picture of a, of a red herring, I'm here to distract you. It is a deliberate attempt to redirect from the argument at hand to an issue that the speaker can better respond to. So what we're talking about with a red herring is there's something that's some question or something has been raised and the speaker, instead of addressing that or responding to it, will go off on a completely different tangent. So person one will present argument A. 
person two will present argument B, and then we don't talk about argument A anymore. Um, we actually see this a lot in politics. We'll see, um, you know, politicians will like to pivot. So you might ask a candidate about their stance on health care, and they don't want to talk about health care. So instead, they decide to shift to their expertise with the military. And so, you know, it it's irrelevant to what's actually at hand, but we see that there still is this, um, this redirection of information of, of argumentation. The next one is appeal to authority. This is the, you know, parents tell you because we said so. Um, we see this one all the time, and it's really, it's pretty simple. It's using someone in an authority position that they may not necessarily be an authority on the facts of the argument as evidence that your argument is true. Um, according to person one, Y is true, therefore Y is true. Um, celebrity endorsements, hap this happens all the time, especially if they're not credible. So for example, Michael Jordan is absolutely credible to talk about uh, Air Jordans and, and anything basketball and basketball shoe related because he's a really good basketball player. That being said, Michael Jordan would not be so credible to talk about food necessarily. Now, he's had a restaurant, but it wasn't successful. And when in the 90s, McDonald's actually put together a McJordan sandwich. They let him design the McJordan sandwich, and it was a double hamburger with barbecue sauce and pickles. And while that may have been a tasty sandwich to Michael Jordan, it ultimately didn't sell well to the general populace and eventually was abandoned. And his name behind it couldn't even help the sandwich. So um, sometimes Sometimes this can work, but sometimes you have to, you know, it comes back to ethos. Is that person actually credible to talk about what they're talking about? And do they have something to back it up more than just, well, I'm an expert, I'm a celebrity. Hasty generalization. Here's my favorite. There's actually an entire meme series of the logical fallacy uh, ref. Hasty generalization. Conclusion reached without considering all variables. Point no good. So that's basically what a hasty generalization is. You're looking at a small sample rather than the more accurate representation. So you kind of cherry pick your examples and it, it you're able to reach this big, large conclusion. So sample S is taken from population P. Sample S is a very small part of population E. The conclusion is drawn from the sample and applied to the population. So for example, with U high students, let's say I talk to uh, I talked to three freshmen, and I talked to them about doing their homework, and I talked to the three biggest go-getters in terms of making sure their schoolwork is done on time. Well, they're, they're clearly getting their homework done on time. So then I make an overgeneralization, a hasty generalization, that UHI students are excellent about completing their homework, when if you talk to the UHI students as a whole, that's probably not always so true. Ad hominem. Once again, we have our logical fallacy ref back here. We have an ad hominem attack. Personal foul attacked the opponent instead of his argument. So that's exactly what that is here. Attacking the person making the argument instead of attacking the actual argument. So person one is claiming why. Person one is a moron, therefore why is not true. Um, what we're looking at here is we're attacking, we're not attacking their argument at all. We're just attacking them as a person. Now, there are times in politics where a politician will attack the character or attack some part of the other person where it's not ad hominem. So you have to be careful. It's not always just attacking the, their opponent. If the attack on the opponent is relevant to the argument, so for example, if you're, if you're talking about military experience and you have a general that's debating, a former general or former military person that is um, debating a lifelong politician who's never been in the military, then they can attack that lack of experience as being valid. However, if they say, well, uh, well, that person woke up on the wrong side of the bed today, that's, that's not the case. So it, ad hominem attack on the person instead of their argument. Bandwagon, uh, you know, this is a pretty straightforward one as well. This is an argument that a conclusion is correct or some action should be taken because everyone is doing it, okay? And so I'm sure you've heard it comes from the phrase jump on the bandwagon. Um, this happens in sports all the time. Um, you know, during the NCAA tournament, there are people, and I'll even include myself in on this, that became fans of Loyola Chicago because they were the small mid-major school 11 seed that made it to the championship or made it to the Final Four and made it pretty deep into the tournament. Um, you know, there the Cubs have had uh, the you know I've known Cub fans that have been lifelong Cubs fans, and um, as a result of that, you know, it's. Um, uh, 
they unfortunately you know they they stuck through it but when the cubs got really good all of a sudden well now the cubs you have many more fans that that are um popping up and coming out jump, coming out of the woodwork so that jump on the bandwagon uh can really be applied across the board appeal tra- to tradition my ancestors ate meat my ancestors had mullets doesn't mean that i'm going to do that too and you know as we see a picture of a person with a mullet so making an argument that is the conclusion is correct because it is the way we've always done it and well we've been doing it for generations so as a result of being able to do this for generations we should keep doing it um a lot of things that you i i think are like this we do class night we do class night in a certain way because it's the way we've always done it um this certainly might happen in your families. Well, you know, someone says, why don't we do Christmas a little bit differently this year? No, well, we've always done it this way. We've always eaten ham and, and had scalloped corn or whatever. You know, you have your tradition. And so, you know, we've been doing X for generations. We should keep doing it. Our ancestors thought it was right. Therefore, it is right. Um, we just do it be- not because we have any reason to keep doing it, but because it's what we've always done. And it's the only thing we really know how to do. The straw man fallacy, this is a little trickier. Um, illegal use of a straw man argument, attempted deflection of an opponent's argument to a point they weren't defending, so the play is no good. This is substituting a person's actual position or argument with distorted, exaggeration, or misrepresented version of the position of the argument. Um, so you can kind of look at this, but here's really what it comes down to. Um, the straw man is, think about setting up a scarecrow. In, you know, out on a farm. So you set up a scarecrow to try to, to uh, scare away birds, but if you've ever actually been around a scarecrow, it's pretty easy to knock one of those down. And that's what the straw man fallacy is really all about. So in your speech, you may be tempted to bring up something on the other side. And I encourage you to actually bring up counter arguments to the argument that you're making. The trick is to make sure that you're not cherry picking the, only, the easiest one to beat down or the straw man argument. So for example, Let's say I'm advocating for changing the school start time to be later, okay? And I'm one of the things I want to attack from the other side is the other side is arguing, well, we're going to be in school later, and so therefore students are going to get bed a half an hour later, and um, are, are really we're not going to see these benefits to sleep. Well, I might counter that, that by saying, you know, in support of, of moving school start time to be later to saying, well, look, no, that's actually wrong. Students are going to be much more awake because their brains are more awake at 8.30 in the morning versus 8 or 7, depending on when your first class is. And as a result, I win. So it's making, it's making sure that you're not just cherry picking one, the easiest argument, that you're actually looking at a good, strong argument if you're look, going to look to a, a counter argument. And the last one we're going to talk about is non sequitur. Uh, we have our most interesting man in the world here. I don't usually use non sequiturs, but when I do, cat. This is a conclusion does not follow the premises. The evidence is not relevant to the conclusion the speaker is trying to present. Um, claim A is made. Evidence is presented for claim A. Claim A therefore, claim C is true. Um, you know, this this is kind of. It's the whole idea of, you know, you're talking about talking something, talking about something, and then someone goes squirrel and is completely somewhere else. Um, you know, going back to the school start time example, let's say we're talking about moving school start time or not moving school start time, and then all of a sudden someone says, we well, you know the real issue is that the gym floors need to be waxed again. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with school start time, but it's a non sequitur. Uh, so it's, it's that whole distraction. Now, uh, the last thing I'll say is, um, before I want you to transition into working on your worksheet, is with logical fallacies, you're not, you're not going to always just see one. You might see something that the categories kind of bleed together. Or even in one example or one commercial or advertisement or one politician, you're going to see this massive overlap. And so you just have to be prepared to address that when those concerns come up. So just making sure that you're aware of that. Um, so you know, in your groups, you've been assigned a couple of videos. So I want you to take those videos now watch them as a group and then there are three questions on the worksheet i want you to provide pretty detailed answers for each of those um and you so you're looking for ethos pathos logos kairos for mr roque's lesson last week and then also you're going to be looking towards you know what what are we doing with these logical fallacies now um i wish you the best of luck and uh, obviously if you have any questions please feel free to let me know